post-World War II, he pioneered research into what he called retrievals of the third kind. And since your audience is made up of a lot of military or ex-military people, I think they should know this. Oh my God. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Sure enough, this craft rose up above uh, the, the Groom Mountain range. It was videotaped. What the hell on earth, dude? Well, if there's like a thing, it's rotating. And Lazar told him, there's going to be a test flight, you know, this week at a certain time. James, how are you, my friend? I'm doing fine, Chris. Uh, glad to be here. Oh, it's great to chat to you again. For our friends at home, James Bartley is uh, w- one of the world's leading authorities on, on everything. I'm just going to say, I'll probably get all this wrong, but extraterrestrial, UFO, um, uh, ph- phenomena, let's call it. And James very kind, kindly invited me on his podcast, I think it was a couple of years back now, and we just ch- we chatted for three hours nonstop. And to just put my cards on the table, it, it, it wasn't even like a subject I've ever really been interested in. I wasn't like an ex, uh, you know, I wasn't kind of a, an X-Files type, oh, the answer's out there and all this kind of stuff. I, I've, I've obviously got a healthy dose of um, scepticism sounds a bit strong, but, but anything that I haven't seen for myself or I can't prove or I can't logic out, I don't judge it, but I'll just say my, my jury's out. I'll, you know, I'm, 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 I don't want to be rude to people that have spent their whole adult lives researching a subject and poo-poo them just because it's not something I've experienced, right? Because that's no different to when people call you, you know, uh, tinfoil hat because you question official narratives, right? And I think we're all starting to understand there's never been a time in, in our histories when questioning official narratives it, it couldn't, be, couldn't be more in, in, in important. Sorry, James, I've gone on a wee bit there. Do you want to just refresh us on um, a little bit of your history, just so we know who you are? Uh, Sure, Chris. Uh, My name is James Bartley. I've been investigating alien abductions and uh, extraterrestrial, interdimensional and subterrestrial uh, life forms and civilizations for like 30 years, over 30 years now. My mentor was Barbara Bartholick, who, in my opinion, was and remains, uh, she's since passed away, uh, the foremost alien abduction researcher in history. Nobody knew as much as Barbara Bartholick and her her first protege and her uh, premier protege was Dr. Carla Turner, who uh, has also passed away. I strongly believe both of them were assassinated actually. And uh, Dr. Carla Turner was also a friend of mine and, and she was a pioneer likewise in this field. So I've had my own alien abduction experiences, which prompted me to embark on this odyssey of of research, investigations, networking with others. I also have a strong background studying military history, studying the aerospace community, studying the intelligence community. Uh, I used to be in military communications as, as a civilian working for Commander Naval Air Force's U.S. Pacific Fleet out of Naval Air Station, North Island in San Diego, California, <coughs> excuse me. So, uh, and I grew up as a Navy brat in a Navy family. So you can say that I was born into a military family. Uh, so I, I'm very familiar with the way the military works. I'm very familiar with how compartmentalization and how secrets are kept and maintained and how cover stories are created. And I would, make a cogent argument that the alien abduction phenomena, the, the recovery of advanced alien technology and the back engineering of such technology 
is arguably the most classified, highly secretive uh, programs, projects in the world, bar none. Uh, what we've seen in the recent past uh, that you alluded to, those are limited hangouts. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned what happened in September 20 some odd years ago. Uh, what they did in that particular instance was the person who became the villain of that piece was actually an ally for many years to the U.S. intelligence community. But the fact that he was an ally was, was memory old, quite frankly. So when you see people presenting themselves as uh, Pentagon experts today, uh, what they've conveniently done is memory hold all of the information that uh, has been uncovered by dedicated researchers for many decades. There's been many, many highly regarded, uh, high integrity witnesses, whistleblowers, military and civilian alike, scientists, engineers who've come forth and shared what they've known, not only from personal experience, but from within the military industrial complex. So when people come around showing videos of UFOs or unusual phenomena and present that as, well, the military is mystified as to what these objects really are. That, that's nonsense. The, the military, elements of the military, intelligence, aerospace community have a very good idea, uh, at least where some of these extraterrestrials come from and have a very good idea of the nature of the technology that some of these civilizations possess. So, you know, just as an opening, uh, I'd like to get that out there. And James, just a little bit about um, your own family ancestry, because I remember we discussed that last time. I, I know you've been around the, the this beautiful planet um, somewhat. Well, my ethnicity, uh, mostly Filipino, throw in some Chinese, throw in some Portuguese and Spanish. So I'm kind of a mutt, <laughs> you might say, but mostly uh, Filipino and Chinese. But you can tell by my accent, I grew up in America. So that's why I sound the way I do. And, and my education was from America. Mm. Do I remember Hawaii for some reason or am I? I only stopped over in Hawaii. I never actually you know, got around and, and visited the place. I only stopped over on, on flights coming and going. Yeah, when you say uh, Filipino, Portuguese, um, Spanish, then my mind just starts thinking about food. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprising. I yeah, I, I want to come to your place and you, you can cook for me. Um. So let's talk about what is a limited hangout. A limited hangout, a classic example of what's going on in, in the UFO field. There's this organization, I think they were called the Threat Assessment Center within the Pentagon, with quite frankly, a Mickey Mouse budget of about $22 million, which it's questionable whether that would pay for a bolt on the F-35 fighter, right? So they have a very small budget and then they analyzed all these videos and imagery uh, of unknowns, right? What's been described as unidentified flying obje objects, unknown aerial phenomena. And there's slang that's come up in, in the intelligence community, fast movers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so what they're talking about when they show these videos However interesting and fascinating they may be, it's still a limited hangout because they're not talking about the history of the, the subject. For example, there was a guy named uh, Stephen Schiff. He was a congressman from the state of New Mexico, and he kept getting, uh, he kept getting letters and he kept being pestered essentially by his constituents in New Mexico about the Roswell event, uh, July 1947, which was the actual retrieval of a crashed alien craft. And there's a whole backstory about that. Uh, sheriff George Wilcox was the sheriff of, of 
Chavez County, if memory serves. And not only was Sheriff George Wilcox threatened with death, but his entire family was threatened with death down to his grandchildren, okay? Because he had been one of the people that had seen the alien bodies and bodies can't be explained away technology or wreckage, no matter how exotic, no matter how unusual uh, the properties, and, and they were quite unusual, that was found at the Roswell Debris Field, can still be explained away. But seeing a humanoid, non-human life form that, that can't be, living or dead, cannot be so easily explained away. And Sheriff George Wilcox was one of the people that saw the bodies and he was threatened with death. And he wasn't the only civilian witness that was threatened with death. And I, I would argue that uh, a, a crash weather balloon would not uh, garner such uh, hostility from the U.S. government and the U.S. military in particular. So getting back to Congressman Stephen Schiff, like the good congressman he was, he acted on his constituents in treaties. So what he did was he got the government accounting office, which is the in-house federal government investigative arm, to do an inventory, an audit, and a search for all information relative to the UFO crash retrieval at Roswell, New Mexico, in July 1947. And Stephen Schiff Schiff was uh, quickly found out that he was being stonewalled by the Pentagon and particularly by the Air Force. But he was tenacious. Once he got his teeth in into the subject, he wouldn't let go. So he kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing. And then eventually, Stephen Schiff died of a quick acting cancer. Now, where have you heard of this before, right? Uh, Thomas Van Flander, and just to give another example of a guy who died of a quick acting cancer, Dr. Thomas Van Flander worked at the U.S. Naval Observatory, and he was aware of a very, very large astronomical body coming up from the southern skies, which was having an effect on the orbits of, of a number of the planets in our solar system. It was exerting a strong downward pull on, on a number of the planets and affecting their orbits. So he went to New Zealand with an eight inch telescope to see what he could see, right? And then within two weeks or so after returning from New Zealand, he likewise died of a quick acting cancer. But that's just an, another example of uh, how the intelligence community uh, does away with some of these people. So the point of relevance is if the, the person, Luis Al uh, Elizondo, is the one who keeps getting on TV these days and other people like him rather than drawing on endlessly about these videos that they've got and about how far out and fantastic and unusual they are. Why don't they talk about Congressman Stephen Schiff dying of a fast acting cancer who was pushing for the government accounting office to reveal everything that they knew about the Roswell event. Why don't they talk to the surviving family members of Sheriff George Wilcox, who was threatened with death. And like I said, he was not the only person threatened with death, uh, civilian. So uh, a, a military person who disappeared was one of the nurses who saw one of the alien bodies. Uh, the coroner, uh, Glenn Dennis, if memory serves, uh, I think he's since passed away, but he was, uh, no, he wasn't a coroner. He, was, he ran a funeral parlor. In, in Roswell, and the Air Force, Army Air Force at the time, contacted him, and they wanted to know if he had hermetically sealed small child-sized coffins, right? Uh, they didn't specify why they needed them. Long story short, Glenn Dennis knew a nurse at the base. I think he'd been dating her for a while, and uh, over a couple of meetings, because the whole base went on alert, uh, you know, he wasn't allowed, he went to the base because there was an injury or a car crash or a plane crash, what he thought was going on. Uh, so he went over there and then he was treated, you know, rather uh, rudely and uh, was uh, treated to some hostile behavior from uh, the military police. 
and left, right? But he eventually got together with this nurse that he knew, this army nurse who told him that what they found out in the desert was this crash of a vehicle. They didn't know what it was. And she'd seen these bodies, which weren't human. Uh, long story short, that nurse wound up disappearing and dying of a, of a alleged plane crash not too long after because she was deemed a security risk, right? So the, the point I'm making is this kind of stuff had been going on all along. And Roswell was just one of a number of of crash retrievals, let's say. That's what they were called. And uh, the godfather, if you will, of crash UFO crash retrieval research was the late, great Leonard Stringfield. Leonard Stringfield was an intelligence officer with the Army Air Force in World War II. He, he served in the 5th Air Force in the Pacific. And post-World War II, he pioneered research into what he called retrievals of the third kind because he developed a number of sources in the military industrial complex who had either taken part in the retrieval of an alien craft that had come to grief somehow, or in the course of their duties, they'd seen alien bodies in conditions of deep freeze or, uh, or otherwise in uh, secret locations. Uh, he was told by one of his sources that by the time 1966 rolled around, 1966, there were already 30 alien bodies at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, where there were a lot of the original Roswell wreckage was taken to because it was the Air Material Command headquarters within which is the Foreign Technology Division. That's where the Air Force had all their high-tech laboratories and uh, engineering plants and what have you, with exactly the kind of place they would take this material for research analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And if you just look at the Roswell case alone, the cast of characters, right? And this will be familiar stuff to people who study this, but if your audience is not really familiar, and since your audience is made up of a lot of military or ex-military people, I think they should know this. Because like I said, the, the subject is so highly classified and highly compartmentalized. You look at the base commander uh, at Roswell, not the base commander, but the, the wing commander of the 509th Bomb Group at Roswell, which at the time was the only nuclear strike force in the world. This was the same outfit that dropped nukes on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was Colonel William Blanchard, who was the chief of staff of uh, uh, General Curtis LeMay in uh, Guam in World War II when they were conducting the, the B-29 uh, air raids against Japan, right? The... Uh, the person who helped initiate the weather balloon cover story at Fort Worth, uh, Car, uh, Carswell Air Force Base, used to be known as it, it outside of Dallas, Fort Worth, was General Roger Ramey. He was a veteran bomber commander in World War II, and he also served in India, uh, the China-Burma-India Theater, and then he served in, in the Marianas under General LeMay. So these are real people, real historical people that were involved in the recovery uh, of the alien technology. And there's one, just, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this too. There's a photograph of General Roger Ramey in his office with a document in his hand. Laid out on the floor was all this junk, like, like aluminum foil, balsa wood, et cetera, et cetera, because that was the weather balloon, right? Now stop and think, would a weather balloon generate so much activity where numerous flights, cargo flights, B-29, C-54 transports flying in and out of Roswell to uh, Carswell Air Force Base, which was the, the, the parent group of the 509th bomb group in, in Roswell, actually Walker, Army Airfield in Roswell, New Mexico, was the 8th Air Force headquarters in Carswell uh, Air Base in, near Fort Worth, Texas. That's where General Roger Ramey was. His chief of staff, Colonel Thomas DuBose, later General Thomas DuBose, admitted in what had amounted to a deathbed uh, confession on videotape that the cover story of a weather balloon was 
it was just that it was a cover story because he helped initiate it, right? The person who demanded that 8th Air Force headquarters initiate the, the cover story was General Clement McMullen from Strategic Air Command who, tell, who phoned 8th Air Force headquarters because by then, I don't know if it was intended or just on a mission or stupidity or what, but in their wisdom at Roswell, they announced to the world that they had recovered a flying disc. And, you know, the, the background of the story was around that time, June, July, 1947, the entire United States was being besieged by flying saucer reports in most of the states. And remember, this is post-World War II. America is one of two superpowers. America is supposed to have total air supremacy over the continental United States. And there were just swarms of these flying saucers and other shaped craft flying all over the place unmolested, right? So it was as a big national security issue, but getting back to Roger Ramey, when he ordered Major Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer from Roswell to pose with the junk that was laying on in his office floor, right? Major Marcel had flown from Roswell to Carswell, <clears throat> excuse me, Army Airfield with some of the wreckage, okay? He was one of two people. The other was Sheridan Cavett, who was an Army Counterintelligence Corps uh, agent who'd went to the ma main debris field and inspected some of the, the, uh, uh, the wreckage. Anyway, he was ordered to fly some of the wreckage to the parent group of the 509th Bomb Group, which is the 8th Air Force. Now, Roger Ramey, was photographed kneeling in front of the balsa wood tin foil and what was supposed to be the the weather balloon. And again, would all this ruckus ensue with sheriffs being threatened with their lives, their families being threatened, their grandchildren being threatened, planes flying in and out of Roswell, all for a weather balloon? Now, the thing that's interesting was the document General Roger Ramey was holding in his hand Fast forward to the present time, this is now several years ago or whatever, with advanced computer enhancement, they were able to, uh, he was holding the document and the page was upside down. They were able to turn the page right side up and zoom in and enhance the document, the parts of it that were visible. And what did you see? Words like wreckage, bodies, et cetera, et cetera, right? So uh, that was not a hoax. And not only that, though, but there were eyewitnesses at the receiving end of the wreckage, Wright-Patterson, what became Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which was Wright Field at the time. There were eyewitnesses there who'd seen the bodies come in, who'd seen the wreckage come in. And there's just a lot of similar stories. So when these guys come along and they say, oh, look at these interesting you know, videos and what have you, they're memory holding everything that went on before. And Roswell was just one, one saucer crash. There was another one, a major one in Aztec, New Mexico, March 1948, not, not even a year later. And there were other ones. So there's a lot of alien technology over the years that's been recovered, that's been back engineered, studied in places like Sandia, uh, Los Alamos, the Skunk Works, places like that, the Lockheed's Advanced Development Project Wing. So, and one other comment, and I'd like your thoughts on this. If people think that this is something that's just a frivolous subject, they ought to plug into what the late Ben Rich said about uh, alien technology. He said that in, in a private letter, and, and what also amounted to a deathbed confession, to an aerospace consultant for the Mutual UFO Network. Uh, he said that uh, he definitely knows that alien technology exists and that the, the technology, the navigation is based on extra, extrasensory perception, right? In other words, the, the ability to control the navigation and, and the steering of these craft is, is based on a direct connection between the mind in some cases in the mind of the pilots and, and the flight 
controls also. So, you know, someone like Ben Rich can't be dismissed as a crank or a conspiracy theorist. He ran Skunk Works after Kelly Johnson retired. And he was the one, the brains behind the F-117, a Nighthawk, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, uh, so when I do the research, I look at it from the hardware perspective, uh, the recovered alien technology and its known capabilities, but also look at it from, you know, the boots on the ground perspective where the rubber meets the road, where pe normal everyday people like me have had encounters with ETs and I've had encounters not only with ETs, but I've had encounters with deep black elements of the military who were deeply involved in the cover up of all this. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to get that out there. Yes, and James, just sorry to harp on about a point, but the actual definition of a limited hangout for me, for, uh, for my understanding, is. It, is for example Roswell in itself, where everyone focuses in on in on that, but really that's it's kind of like a diversion from the the actual real narrative. So uh, a a limited hangout, say, um, it's it's where a lot of interested parties will literally hang out on this information, dissecting it and sharing it and believing it. And it's forming there, but it's actually really, it's kind of like a, uh, um, to throw people off. Yeah. Like a smoke to, and mirrors, to, like a to diversionary keep, thing to keep people yeah. off the scent. Yeah. And that's the point I was making about these people that have come up out of nowhere the last several years, the, the so-called threat assessment center at the Pentagon with the, the Mickey Mouse $22 million budget. Sure, they're interesting, compelling videos. I've seen better, and many of my colleagues have seen better. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to make it seem like it's all a new thing, right? And they're keeping it still at arm's length. Okay, here's a video of, of an unknown object. Uh, so they're hovering above the water, then it goes into the water, right? But they're avoiding the rubber meets the road aspect, the, the actual recovery of the technology itself, the back engineering, the research and, and analysis. Like I've, I met Bob Lazar, okay, and I, and I, I talked to him briefly, and I've been out at uh, near Area 51, and I've seen some of the craft that have flown out of there. And these are not the kind of craft you see at a normal airport or a normal air, military air base. Uh, these are luminous craft, silent, uh, and I, I seen several craft fly right over my head in the middle of the night there. And I know others that have seen all kinds of things uh, at the test site out there. And that's just one place. There's other places, the, uh, the high desert of Southern California, the Antelope Valley, where so many of the aerospace corporations are. That's where a lot of this, uh, a lot of those bases are underground as well. And so they, they work on all this technology and then they test fly it at places like Area 51 or S4 in the Nevada desert is one of a number of places where they test fly these. But I, I would say at this point that they have, uh, they probably have fleets of uh, what's been described as alien replicated vehicles. These are craft based on alien technology uh, and uh, field propulsion electromagnetism, electrogravitics. So that technology has been, even Ben Rich himself said that the military now fly the stars. Uh, and he said this decades ago. So that, that should be taken into account. If they ever do a fake alien invasion, you hear a lot about that. I would argue that, well, the invasion has already occurred. The, these non-human beings have covertly and not so covertly guided uh, the development of our civilization uh, to the point when, when you look at it now and everything is inverted, all these <laughs> abominations they're trying to normalize, uh, all, all this oppression, all this uh, vulgarity, et cetera, et cetera, that's being normalized 
uh, we're supposed to accept it as just being perfectly normal, but it's anything but, I would argue that the source of that is non-human. I would say that the source of all this oppression, all this rage, all this warfare that's plagued humanity for so long, I, I would argue that that it's non-human in origin. And I, I think that I'm not saying that we're, we're seeing the final act, but I could say that maybe, you know, the final curtain has started to rise and maybe the act before the final curtain, before the final act. I think that things are going to start to come to a head here uh, before too long. And, uh, and another thing also about the so-called elite that run this planet, a lot of their heinous practices that they indulge in, which again, they're trying to normalize. Uh, that's anything but normal, what we would call human behavior. Uh, because if, if we go back to the lore uh, of all these civilizations around the earth, they always talk about this inner breeding, this hybridization between the gods, if you will, and, and humanity, and how this hybrid uh, Brahma, Brahmin class, if you will, uh, has this priesthood uh, in its various forms around the world that's taken over, basically as intermediaries between the gods and humans. And it's these laws that they make up and all, all these pagan forms of worship uh, that they've created, uh, which they've normalized again. And the symbology of this is all around us. So uh, if there is a fake alien invasion, it's only because the aliens want there to be a fake alien invasion. It's kind of a, a final nail in, in this you know, control system, so to speak. My gosh, this, friends at home, this is a man that, that knows his subject. Um, I see Bob Lazar gets quite a hammering on Wikipedia, which um, I'm always quite, my uh, red flag indicators go up when Wikipedia tries to publicly destroy someone. It, 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 it does make you wonder, um, I mean, once you use the term conspiracy theories, you, you've just lost the high ground. You've just lost, uh, you know, it, 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 it says so much about what, what you're trying to achieve. So, well, you know, Lazar has brought people out there to the test site. He brought John Lear, who was the son of, of the creator of the Lear jet. And John Lear himself was a CIA pilot and, and well known in the UFO field for, for many years. And Lazar told him there's going to be a test flight you know, this week at a certain time, and I know where to go to see it. And sure enough, this craft rose up above uh, the, the Groom Mountain Range. It was videotaped that that, you know, made uh, world news back in the, the, the late 80s, early 90s, right? And Lazar said things that only an insider could have known. He said from the military perspective, it's actually the Navy, elements of the Navy and Naval Intelligence that ran a large part of the alien back engineering program. And, and that would make sense from a historical standpoint because the Air Force didn't branch off from the Army until, what, 1948. Now, before that, uh, the real technological branch of the U.S. military was the Navy. Uh, and elements of the Navy still are extremely super advanced compared even to the Air Force. So, you know, how, how would he know that unless... He was a part of the program. And, and also George Knapp, who was the first to break the story about Bob Lazar in Area 51. George Knapp was the investigative reporter for KLAS uh, News in Las Vegas. And he'd found a source that actually worked at the same facility as Bob Lazar, uh, S4. And so he put this source that he found together with Bob Lazar. And this source told Bob, uh, George Knapp, I think Bob Lazar is a phony. I think he's a fraud. And I'll prove it to you. So George Knapp put him together with Bob Lazar. And this guy asked him specific questions. How do you pay for the food? How do you get from here to there? Could you describe the layout of the cafeteria, et cetera, et cetera? And this guy came back to George Knapp and said, yeah, he's legitimate because there's no way he could have known about these places, known about how you do things there without actually having been there. And, you know, there's other forms of, of proof of the fact that they erased so much of his, 
is educational history. And when you hear the skeptics say, oh, Bob Lazar, he can't prove that you know, he was educated in any of these places. That's the oldest trick in the book. Some of these atomic veterans who were irradiated in, in the, uh, the nuclear, thermonuclear test, test in the Pacific, and also those veterans that were ordered to conduct maneuvers uh, within an hour after tests going off on the surface in, in Nevada, they've totally pigeonholed uh, their their, uh, medic, uh, their military records made it seem like they weren't even in those places uh, where they got irradiated and where they developed cancers of one form or another because of their exposure to you know the radiation. So we know from past history they will do things like eradicate people's past uh, in order to maintain the cover up. But I, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah. So Bob Lazar claimed that during the um, uh, during the eighties, he he worked in reverse engineering extraterrestrial te- technology. Um, he's been on the Joe Rogan show. I remember, I think I I saw that episode, and he 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 comes ac- he comes across in two ways: either one hundred percent legit and genuine, or some sort of psychopathic like bent that means he sounds like he really is, is, is genuine. And I don't claim to know, know either way, but um, what um, you, you mentioned you had experience of abduction. Can you tell us a bit more about that, James? Well, my first experience was when I was about four years old. I was living in Texas at a time. My dad was based in Texas. I can't remember if he was at the time with Naval Air Station Corpus Christi or uh, Naval Air, what became known later as Naval Air Facility uh, Kingsville, but they're quite close to each other. And he, he was posted at both bases at one time or another. So I don't can't really remember which one he was at the time, but... Uh, as a frame of reference, uh, it was the autumn, and I remember that because my mom was ironing his his uh, duty uniform, which was uh, the dark navy uniform. And in North America, they only wear that in the autumn or the winter, right? So sometime around that time frame, I would say, I reckon this would have been around mm, 67, 68, thereabouts. I had an encounter in my bedroom. It's a long story. I've mentioned it many times on my own podcast and on other interviews. I won't go into detail here, but uh, it was a small being. I'd say about three, three and a half feet high. It levitated. It floated in my bedroom. And it was about dusk. I remember that because I was playing in my bedroom alone and we had Venetian blinds uh, on the windows and the waning sunlight was beaming in like i said it was dusk it was starting to be dusk and i could see the dust boats hanging in the air illuminated by you know the the waning sunlight coming in through the venetian blinds and then i I turn around and then there's this little critter that's just floating there right and you know being a little kid and being quite territorial and possessive of my belongings like my toys and what have you it wasn't a case of me being frightened. It was a case of me being very territorial. It's like, what are you doing here? You know, the implication being, this is my stuff. This is my room. These are my toys. What are you doing here? Get out of here. Right. And uh, I went out to the living room to let my mom know that there's this little, I call him a little man in in the bedroom. And my mom was ironing my dad's uniform. Uh, she couldn't be bothered, right? She just thought I was just babbling on about something. So long story short, I, I grabbed her by the elbow, literally drug her back uh, to my bedroom, flung the door open, right? Of course, the being wasn't there. And then my mom got upset and stormed off. I walked into the bedroom, closed the door behind me, and then he manifested again, almost with an I told you so kind of expression, right? And then it telepathically talked to me and told me a few things. Uh, And that was my first 
experience that I'm aware of, but uh, it, things really kicked in a high gear. And these experiences happen intermittently, cyclically over the years. Uh, there were some, you know, big years like the, like the early mid seventies, 74, 75, I would wake up with these horrific nosebleeds. My whole pillow would be saturated with blood. On one occasion, as a young boy, I was laying in bed, I was immobilized and I felt this long metal probe being shoved up my nose, my nostril. And then, you know, I felt this popping painful sensation and I blacked out. And the next morning, my pillow was covered with blood. Uh, I used to wake up with uh, stickers and dirt on my uh, on the bottom of my socks uh, in the morning as if I'd been outdoors at night. So, you know, things like that is unusual stuff would happen. But things really came to a head in 1990. I just come back from Germany. I spent an, um, the summer in Germany on a language study program and then went back to San Jose, California. And within a span of several weeks, in, starting around early September uh, 1990, I just had a series of experiences culminating in a, in a full-blown, full waking consciousness experience when I woke up and I found what I later came to know as, as three reptilian greys. Uh, they were the familiar, I'm sure you've seen the iconography and the pictures and what have you, the, the big heads and you know, the, the really eyepieces, the big black eyes are really eyepieces. Uh, but instead of normal hands, if you will, they were claws, they were clawed hands, and which Dr. Carla Turner referred to as chicken claws, right? So I woke up to find three of those in my bedroom. Uh, and I've told the story before in another podcast. I'm not going to get into details, but, you know, they took me up into their big craft and just things really unraveled from there. So, you know, the next morning I was a basket case, as, as you can understand. But in order to control my fear and the anxiety I was feeling is by then, like I said, that was a culmination. There were several things that happened before that when I came back in September, 1990 as a way to gain control of this situation. I just immersed myself in research. Clearly what happened was an encounter with something non-human. Mm -hmm. So I just kept going back to the bookstore. This is long before the internet. I kept going back to, the bookstore in the shopping center uh, I had to actually drive quite a distance to get there. And I just basically cleaned the place out of every book I could find about alien abductions and UFOs in general. Right. So did you, did you not, or did you fit, did you feel any need to investigate whether you might have been suffering from that? Th this is some, episode related to childhood trauma? Well, the experience absolutely was traumatizing. I was yeah. skittish and had you know, a high degree of anxiety and trauma for some time. And it was, that was precisely one of the reasons why I immersed myself in the research mm -hmm. to, to gain control, to regain control. But as far as any kind of uh, trauma from my childhood, which may have accounted for that, uh, no, I, I would say, you know, it's kind of like, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing. Because when I did a life review and what I did was I, I got like a yellow legal pad of, of paper and just wrote down from as far back as I remember every unusual thing that ever happened to me. Right? And after several pages. I realized that this thing was with me, whatever it was, all my life. And then further down the track, I realized that there was also this deep black military element in my life as well. We, we now know, we have known at least since the late 19, uh, mid, late 1980s, that there's a deep black military aspect to this, where certain people that have alien abduction experiences also on occasion are essentially kidnapped by deep black elements of the military, and they vary from the Army, Air Force, uh, Navy, depending on what part of the country you're at. And also, sometimes one week, 
And this has happened to friends of mine. It could be the Air Force abducting them. And then a week or two later, it's the Navy abducting them, right? And they're, they're taken to a secure location, uh, very often in a military facility or underground, uh, or if they've rented out or leased out like office space in some, some apart office complex somewhere in town or nearby, they'll take you there and they will use narco hypnosis. They will utilize mind control. Uh, they will also train some of these people, right? In paramilitary uh, activities, let's say. And they will also train them to survive in possible future contingencies, future apocalyptic scenarios, if you will. And it runs the gamut from trying to survive in a nuclear, biological, chemical environment, uh, um, foreign military invasion, uh, alien invasions. I mean, it, it zombies, literally, some of these scenarios involve, you know, training to survive zombie attacks and the zombie attack dreams and zombie attack training goes back decades, right? I remember having those things a long time ago. So now people are talking about, well, these, and I won't go into details, but let's just say prions and uh, things possibly related to mad cow disease, which we're hearing about nowadays. Uh, some of that stuff was a reality for us in our training and some of the scenarios that we were made to take part in. So James, can you just clarify for us, are you saying um, post being abducted, you were then um, approached by these dark elements of the military for training or, or, for, or, or have I misunderstood something? The involvement in the interest in me uh, by deep black elements of the military and medical military community went back to childhood. Uh, I was, uh, like I said, I was a Navy brat. And you understand what it was like uh, being in the uh, Navy or rather being in the Royal Marines that uh, when you go to a doctor, it's typically it's a military doctor. And uh, my, my father was, was an enlisted person. The the doctors in the Navy tend to be lieutenant commanders, commanders, and captains, right? A captain being equivalent to, a, as you know, like a colonel in the Air Force or the Army. So the gulf between an enlisted guy and a Navy captain, in our example, that's a huge gulf. And if this Navy doctor, in our example, says, oh, you know, give your son these pills or whatever, or take your son to this, that, or the other uh, medical facility, they're going to do it without question because it's ingrained in them as, as a military guy and as a military wife. They're not going to question. Uh, and what happened with me, and I'm by no means the only person this has happened to, there have been many, many, many people like me Right? Because in my subsequent investigations, I found out that some of them are laughing because it's funny. Right, I found out that some of the military medical facilities I was taken to as a boy were notorious later on for mind control. Oak Knoll Naval Hospital, Naval Medical Center in Balboa Park, San Diego, uh, Letterman Army Hospital in, in the Presidio in San Francisco. All those places later became infamous or, or um, well known within the research community as far as places where people were taken for mind control. Now the, I know that is that sorry? M, is that what we'd know as MK Ultra? Well, it may be an offshoot of that, and I know some people the knee jerk response because so many of them, uh, you know, succumb to brainwashing basically to think that aliens don't exist and only. You know, there's only mind control. There's no aliens involved, right? Well, I, I'm here to say that, in my view, a military abductee in my lab, as we call it, my definition of, of a my lab is someone who's a legitimate alien abductee first, who over time somehow draws the attention of these deep black elements of the military. Uh, and that was the case with me. So from an early age, I mean, I, on one occasion, I woke up 
uh, in a medical clinic with these wires attached to my head and, and the whole bit, right? Don't even have any memory of how I got there. So what's happened to me is not unusual, but it, it really gets into the whole alien military deep black connection, which goes back many decades uh, because some abductees have, and in the general population, you will find people that have uh, very strong intuitive gifts, let's say. But for whatever reason, some people that have also had alien abduction experiences, some of them tend to have quite pronounced psychic abilities. And these abilities are exploited by deep black elements of the military where they're kidnapped, uh, they're, they're made to conduct remote viewing or, or uh, conduct astral, what amounts to astral espionage, right? So we, we know that remote viewing was practiced by, by the military for many years. Uh, people have come out from within uh, the Stargate program within the Pentagon and <clears throat> Stanford Research <clears throat> Institute in Palo Alto, California, which really was not too far from where I lived. But that was just one, one branch of it. There was other branches far, far more highly compartmentalized and far more secretive than that. That's just what people know about, right? What they've read about in books. But the, the fact that people have been used against their will as psychic operatives, basically, that's been going on for a long time. And somehow or other, deep black elements of the military glommed onto the fact that some of these people having alien abduction encounters, they seem to have these innate metaphysical abilities, which they can tap into. Right. So they're, they're exploited basically as, uh, as, um, as resources. There's nothing uh, it's exploitative, extremely exploitative. And some of these people uh, like myself have endured a lot of trauma and a lot of uh, abuse quite frankly, from these, uh, these military controllers. So, I mean, people I know have been tortured. I know women who've been gang raped by, by military personnel in order to fragment their psyches even more. So there's nothing glamorous. When I hear people talking about being a super soldier, it just, I just roll my eyes because it irks me no end. Uh, these are people that have been really abused, uh, but that I don't want to paint a victimhood kind of, slant to it all because these people are you know they're victors not victims they don't see themselves as victims uh, although they have been victimized in the past but right you have to roll with it you have to turn the page you have to get on with life because you know one thing that i would say one of the things that has helped held me in good stead today in today's modern snitch society right is that because of these experiences, because I came from a military family anyway, uh, keeping things close hold, keeping things close to the vest, and essentially living as a spy amongst all these people all this time uh, is second nature to me now. So when I sit there and I listen to these people lambast others for endangering their safety and all this other stuff, I can just sit there like a fly in a wall and you know, I'm, I'm not going to disabuse them of that. I'm not going to try to inform them or wake them up or anything. It's like I'm undercover as far as that, that goes, right? So that's held me in good stead because I've been like this all my life. I mean, it may, it may seem contradictory because I'm on a podcast now, but, uh, you know, this is only one part of my life. No, no one that's not involved in my field Can I just chuck knows, knows the side of me, right? Can I just chuck some stuff out here, James? I, yeah, I don't yeah, want please. To sound, I don't want to sound in any way like um, dismissive or disrespectful, but I just think as scientists, um, and by scientists I mean you know people that are interested in 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 truth, isn't it? Essentially, um, I get a bit kind of upset because I talk to lots of people, obviously. And whenever anyone uses the term military brat, I personally think it says so much about um, 
I don't know, maybe like how they're feeling about themselves. Mm. I only uh, I only use it because I, I haven't come up with anything, <laughs> another synonym, you know, other than to say I grew up in a military family. Yeah, I don't I, think of I, myself as a brat, if that's what you mean. No, it's just, I, it's I, a, an American Americana. It's a very common term. So that's why. I use yeah, it. I, it, but it's the same when people suck up to you about being in the middle. It's just. Just, dude, you live your life. I, I just live mine different to you. I'm, I'm no, yeah. you know. Um, I'm sorry. I just want to explain so we don't all <laughs> people listening don't don't think I'm um, trying to be uh, um, disruptive. Like, I, I just mean that military kids go through a lot. Uh, can go through a lot of trauma, uh, identity wise. Um, fitting in the, the numerous moves, the different schools that you go to, the different countries that you might find yourself living in and, and adapting in. In addition, the most important role model in a, in a boy's life, which should be his father, well, he's not there most, you know, a good percent of, of the year. Now, we shouldn't dismiss this. No, this, I don't, yeah. This is why I always get upset with people using a ne- such a negative term as brat about themselves, even although I get it, I get it, it, it. We do these things without thinking. It's the same in the substance misuse world. When people use the word clean, I just think, dude, dude just, just stop there a minute. You, you saying like I'm, I'm dirty, but you, but you, you, you know, because I've had a mental health issue, we really need to think about uh, language, but I don't, I don't want to get off the subject. It, it's just that I, I, I think it needs to be recognised in in this equation that that you went through a lot. Whether that made you susceptible, susceptible to being approached by alien entities or whether the trauma was manifesting in, in, in this way that might have led you to believe that. Um, and the reason I'm saying this is, well, we're, we're, you know, we're a podcast and this is what we do. We, we look at life and we try to make, make a little bit of sense of it. Right. Um, I, I don't know, I, 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 but then I, I should also add the reason I'm, I, I first got this notion was there was a film. I can't remember what the movie was, but there was a film about this, about a young man that believed this. And when it came out, it, it turned out he'd been subjected to horrendous like abuse through his childhood. Mm-hmm. Then let's take this one stage further. We also know you know, why Hollywood put, put a very um, selective in which narratives they put out there to put people off the scent of, of, of the truth. I just wanted to bring this up, James, to see if it was something, had, had you ever considered this? Or was it like, no, Chris, that, that definitely was not, definitely was not the case. Have I gone through trauma as a child? Yeah, I'm sure I have. Uh, you know, I, I it wasn't like this pristine kind of childhood, so there was different forms of trauma. But one of the forms of PSD, PTSD rather, uh, that is very common with people like me that have had alien abduction experiences is because, precisely because, you know, we've had these alien abduction experiences you know, we're skittish. I mean, a lot of us were afraid of the dark. We're afraid of uh, certain parts of the house. Certain, you know, I I know of kids that don't even want to be on the second floor of their home even during daylight uh, because of the experiences that they've had. Uh, some kids have a morbid fear of of wardrobes, what, what they call closets in America, and it's not surprising because from time immemorial, right stories abound of these creatures that come out of wardrobes. Even that old children's story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, And some of the investigations I did in the high desert of Southern California, there were literally reptilian beings coming out of 
uh, these wardrobes, these closets in, in, into a children's bedroom, right? And, and me and my mate, what we would do is we'd flip a coin. Whoever won got to sleep on the bed. The other guy slept in the sleeping bag on the floor. And, and you know, we took it in turns night after night to sleep in that bedroom where the entities were coming out at night. And they did come out at night sometimes, right? We had encounters with these beings that came out because um, that happened to be their habitat, basically, was what, that house. How did that uh, materialize? What, what, did you, what did you see or what did you experience? Well, on one occasion, when I was sleeping on the floor in a sleeping bag, I woke up and there was a very large, dark being standing above me. And it was, it was a reptilian, for lack of a better term. And I was immobilized. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. And I was terrified, as you could imagine. And uh, I couldn't even get a squeak out. And then I blacked out, right? And another occasion, I was sleeping on a bed this time. And, and my friend, who I've also interviewed in my podcast, he was on the floor in the sleeping bag. And I woke up with a start because I heard some rustling coming out of the closet, right? And so I, I looked over at the closet because I was worried something was going to come out of it. Next thing you know, I, I just I was struck on both sides of my face and knocked out. And, um, you know, for about two weeks after that, I had a really sore face. Well, what happened was, see, there were it was one basic group of reptilians that were coming out from this underground base that they lived at. Right. Which there was also a deep black Navy base underground also in that same area. And the one that punched me out was an immature juvenile. It could have been an infant. It was only about three, four feet high. We call them baby Godzillas, for lack of a better term, because it, that's what it looked like to us, right? And, and when we drew sketches of them, it looks like a baby Godzilla. But um, it punched me out and knocked me out. But, but I was thankful for it later because it could easily have clawed the hell out of me, right? So uh, for whatever reason, it just decided to punch me, well, which was fine with me. But, uh, well, but, but the point of relevance was if he asked me if this was something that I had you know, due to trauma that I'd somehow concocted it or something, or, or it was something that I, I, as a way to cope or whatever. Uh, no, that's not the case. Because one thing about me is I know my own mind, right? I, I know when intrusive thoughts try to come in from some source that's not my own, right? Uh, I, I know when I see things, because uh, when I look at something, I objectively try to suss out what it is. Because uh, I've seen what I consider to be alien craft, but I've also seen man-made advanced field propulsion craft. I could pretty much tell the difference between the two, uh, well, at yeah, least can, cer certain, certain types of craft. I've seen lectures where they point out the features on these uh, discs, what, what we call flying saucers in the old days. Yeah. And the lecturer can point out, due to the technology on them, wh whether it's man-made or whether it's, actually extraterrestrial so yeah and i'd like i'd like to point out really quickly that there's a notion that all triangular shaped craft are of necessity man-made that's not the case the, the triangle is a universal shape so some of the some of the craft are non-human some of them are crewed by aliens for lack of a better term but others and i've seen a number of the ones seen uh created by humans I've seen a number of them in Northern California and in San Diego. So they definitely have a, a, a particular um, feel to them. And they, they, they look and they sound a certain way. Sometimes if you're close enough to them, you can hear an electrostatic buzzing sound if you're standing directly beneath them. So anyhow, I, I know we're running out of time here, but, but, but thanks no, for, no, not a, for, not for letting me come on. What I've done, James, I've just been writing some things down that come into my head. Um, and I just want to sort of chuck them at you so we can come up with something for our audience uh, because what you said there about the reptilian form specifically coming from underground this is a, a fairly recurring theme if you ever look at this type of 
narrative on on the social media channels or the the, the video platforms. It's not you're not the first person to come up with um, this this notion. For example, I had a chat on my podcast, Bob, uh, Bob, 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 Bob. Just see quickly if I can Bob's name up. Um, dun, dun, dun. Oh, hang on. Maybe I had him. Yeah. Robert Wiegand. Um, and we had a podcast and he was just telling me with utter sincerity about one of these reptilian life forms, just walking, walking through a wall. Um, he was talking about the table of, I think he referred to as a table of 500, this, this table of elites that, that uh, this is where it all gets confusing because I have no doubt there probably is some table of elites that, 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 that push, push all the buttons on the planet. Um, <laughs> whether, whether this is the same thing Rob, Robert was referring to, but it, it's not a new thing is what I'm trying to say. So can we just ascertain what where do these greys come from what are these reptilian forms how how does that fit in with say when you hear terms like is it is it archons um who are kind of supreme supreme beings what how how is all this connected james well, the term archon is, is, I wouldn't say it's a generic term, but it's kind of a, an umbrella term that describes one or more of these non-human godlike beings, if you will, that have had a abiding interest in humanity, frequently interferes with humanity, frequently interbreeds with humanity. I, I use the term archon as kind of a generic term to describe essentially negative beings that are parasitical in nature, right? Because, you know, the, the beings of all stripes, they run the gamut, you know, from the negative polarity all the way to very positive, benign, angelic, if you will, and all points in between. Some are neutral, some don't really care about us one way or the other. They may just be passing through or whatever, and others uh, are more agenda-oriented, right? Uh, the grays that you referred to, I think the gray body type that we're accustomed to through uh, eyewitness accounts, as well as uh, you know what Hollywood has done, they represent a particular type of, of ET form. Uh, I believe there are a number of factions of so-called grays, and they're not all gray. Uh, some, could, some are like chalky white in color, some... Uh, are more grayish in appearance, some are more blue-gray, some are blue. I mean, they run the gamut. They have the same general shape, but some are stockier than others. Some are quite frail when, when you look at them. Uh, and some of them come from particular points in space that we've identified. Uh, Zeta Reticuli, uh, I think it's 37 light years uh, from, from our star system. But the, the technology that Bob Lazar worked on was from the Zeta Reticulin, Reticulin system. And he's by no means the only military insider or someone involved in the military aerospace community who's talked about these Zeta beings. Uh, Dan Sherman was a intuitive communicator who worked for Air Force, uh, the Air Force Security Service, which is the, that's what it used to be called. It was the, uh, the NSA element of the Air Force. And in the early 1970s, he was part of a deep, deep black, what he called the gray program called Project Preserve Destiny. And he was told when he was right into the program that at some point, the grid's going to go down. All power and everything else around the world is going to go down, but they're still going to need to communicate with at least one type of ET uh, beings. And in this case, there were, once again, Z these Zeta beings. I don't know if it was the exact same group that, you know, provided the technology that Bob Lazar worked on, but at any rate, 
he was told, Dan Sherman was told, and he's got a verifiable background, this guy does, that the beings he had to learn how to telepathically communicate with uh, were from Zeta Reticuli. He was an alien abductee, and his mother was an alien abductee, and uh, it was a joint NSA Zeta Reticulin program to genetically enhance Dan when he was still in his mother's womb and then guide him you know, through childhood, through his teenage years, eventually, you know, shunting him into the Air Force Security Service to specifically be in this program. So the point of relevance is that's one type of gray from Zeta Reticuli. Now, as far as the reptilians are concerned, there are various types of reptilians. There's not just one kind. Some are subterrestrial. They live in the big cavern systems beneath the earth, and they've been here, you know, as long or if, if not longer than we have. Uh, and then there are extra reptilians that are extraterrestrial, and there are some that are interdimensional. Uh, it's not interdimensionality and extraterrestrial are not mutually exclusive. It's just a matter of frequency and vibration. And some of these beings, they have the ability, not only do they come from another planet, another solar system in our cosmos, but they have the means to go to other dimensions. This simple matter of altering their vibrational density, their, their frequency. Uh, and some of these beings fall into all three categories where some of these reptilians have established bases here from time immemorial. They might as well be earthlings because they've been here so long. But what they've done, and, and you can follow this in the lore of so many uh, First Nation peoples here on Earth uh, through what we would now call a genetic engineering program, They've crossbred, essentially mated with, uh, but also using advanced genetics with the human surface population and created a hybridized race of themselves, which I believe are the hybrid plantation managers who actually run this planet. And it should be pointed out that uh, there were others before David Icke who were talking about this. In fact, you know, you know David Icke you know, used some of my material in his Children of the Gods book, which is fine with me. Right. Uh, but uh, the point is that people like my mentor, Barbara Bartholik, Dr. Carla Turner and others, Bill Hamilton was another guy. He was a member of Air Force uh, Security Service himself, a Russian linguist. He had his own alien abduction experiences. And uh, he, it, he knew all about the reptilians. His wife had had reptilian encounters. So it looks like I froze. I don't know if you can still hear me, but. Um, yeah, I can still hear you. Yeah, but, but yeah, I mean, so I'm not talking about people that are, you know, crackpots. I'm talking about people that are very, very uh, switched on, that uh, have verifiable uh, backgrounds, like Bill Hamilton is a classic example where his own wife was having reptilian experiences. As a matter of fact, on, on one occasion, I was standing outside of their trailer at uh, near Area 51. We were supposed to ironically meet late at night, like three in the morning for a sky watch. While I was waiting for them to come out, that's when these seven craft flew over, which I talked about earlier. But what I didn't know until later was, and I was standing right outside their, their trailer, uh, his wife, Pam, was having an encounter with a reptilian, a reptilian. Now, this reptilian had followed her around all her, most of her life. It regarded her as, as its mate, essentially, right? She was an RH negative herself, which is figures prominently in our field as far as blood types are concerned. And so while I'm outside their trailer waiting for them to come out, she's having an encounter with a reptilian. Bill is laying next to her paralyzed in bed, couldn't do anything about it. So anyway, that, that's just some stories that I've heard over the years. But that was an example when I was, I was right outside the trailer when that encounter was going on. I wanted to talk about the technology um, because one thing that always makes me chuckle is when uh, certain parties in this world want you to believe that um, man got in a tin can, filled it with fossil fuel and then went to another planet. It, it always kind of makes me chuckle a, a bit for the simple reason the way to 
the, the way to travel interplanetary, if that's even a word, um, would involve such a clever con con conception or concept of technology that you ain't going to get there in a rocket. Um, the 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 other side, the inter interdimensional stuff, that requires a you know probably a slightly deeper and um, a much deeper understanding than physics, probably a much deeper understanding than quant quantum physics. But with respect to just actual geographical travel within this this incredible solar system or, or universe. I'm guessing you would need to manipulate matter, uh, atoms, molecules. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not a physicist, but it, you, 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 you don't get from A to B by putting a shitload of gas in your tank and going, boof, you know, like e evil can evil jumping the the Snake River can Canyon. It it's got to be some clever conception of how you man manipulate sp um, space, whether that's a space here uh, on Earth or, or whatever. Do you have any ideas how they might how they how it's possible to do that? And I just chip in. Uh, or how we're doing it, because obviously it's been alleged that the Germans had uh, flying saucer technology, whether or not that was in any way, shape or form, the same technology that, that our visitors from, from uh, you know, outer space, if, if that's, if I can refer to them as that, um, so what, what, what do you think we're talking here, James, te technology-wise and, and, and for, the, for the both um, types of travel? Well, the general principles of, of field propulsion, electrocovitics, electromagnetism, they've been studied and have been put into practice from an engineering aerospace perspective for some time. There were actually articles in a popular American magazine called Popular. It was called Popular Mechanics from the 1950s. Uh, Bill Hamilton showed me the, uh, uh, the actual magazine. He saved it after all these years. And it talked about how in the future, you know, the craft of the future wouldn't require wings. It wouldn't require propulsion or jets as we understood it. It would, you know, it would basically fly like a flying saucer, right? And after a certain point in time, those types of articles began disappearing from the, uh, the, the aerospace journals because it, all of it went black, all of it went uh, highly classified. We know at least one particular race, the aforementioned Zeta Reticuleans, the way Bob Lazar described it, and you can probably still find that video he made of it way back when, uh, Secrets from the Government Bible, where he basically gave a class on video about how their propulsion works. The, uh, the fuel that those beings from Zeta Reticula use, at least that race or that group, they call it, Bob Lazar coined the term element 115. Uh, it's a stable element that produces a, a, its own gravity wave. And what they do is they amplify these gravity waves point it to a distant point in space, power up the amp uh, gravity amplifiers, and essentially pull that distant part of space to the craft, right? So interstellar travel doesn't involve traveling at or near the speed of light in a linear fashion. Uh, that's thinking in, in very conventional terms. It, mm -hmm. This particular race, I don't know how any other race does it, but this particular race, pulls the distant point in space towards it. And then when that distant point in space is now surrounding the craft, they, they simply turn off the, uh, or they power down the gravity amplifiers and, and use a different mode of propulsion to get around. Uh, 
but that's how it essentially warps space, kind of like in Star Trek terms, and, you know, the warp drive, right? So that's how that particular race does it. I don't know how, you know, all the other races do, but it must be remembered that most star systems are binary or multiple star systems. And some of these other, probably many of these other star systems would tend to have elements that are naturally occurring there, but are not naturally occurring here. And this element 115 fuel, which Bob Lazar handled, and he was the one that came up with the term element 115, uh, it's an example of that, which is it's not native to Earth, not even available anywhere else in our solar system. If memory serves, Lazar said that Los Alamos had something like 70 pounds of it, uh, that, which they use for research purposes. So, uh, but again, that's one particular type of extraterrestrial race. It doesn't mean that they all utilize the same uh, propulsion system with the same means of interstellar travel, but basically, it doesn't have anything to do with traveling at or near the speed of light in a linear mode. And as far as the moon is concerned, yes, I believe they got to the moon. I don't think they got there in the way they tell everybody in these flimsy tin cans. And somehow they, you know, the astronauts got past the Van Allen belt without being irradiated. Uh, and then somehow they, if you just look at the film from it all, it was all on a stage. It was all just fake and, yeah, it's just an example of just more quackery and more fakery. But uh, as far as the Germans were concerned, uh, there seems to be this school of thought that, you know, the German uh, advanced uh, craft system, let's say, uh, was the be all and the end all and explains away all these UFO sightings. But, but I don't believe that. I, I do feel that they did have... The, uh, a program uh, underway where they were trying to develop this kind of technology, which the U.S. later on, when they actually recovered some alien technology, they began their program, uh, but it was deep black. Uh, if the Germans had the kind of huge fleets that they were ascribed to have by many researchers, I would have thought they would have used it during World War II, right, <laughs> instead of you know, just sending up these Heinkels and Dorniers and Messerschmitts. You know, if, they, if they've got the technology, why don't they use it, right? But uh, they didn't appear to do that. Yeah, I mean, and, they, uh, they resorted to just chucking a load of explosives into a rocket and send, sending it over the English Channel, didn't they? It's not, not yeah. exactly... Uh, it, it was very effective. Um I'm talking about the doodle bugs here, aren't I? The, yeah, they the made this, ones. Yeah, they made this horrible, horrible whistling sound as they as when they got to altitude over the target and then began to drop out the sky. They made this terrifying whistle to to frighten the population. But the the last thing, James, I want to come on, and this is my understanding of it, is uh, out in Hollywood back in the, what we'd be talking, uh, I'm guessing, I don't, I'm not even going to say, but you had these amateur scientists, rocket scientists, and they're out there in the desert and they're trying to get this um, rocket in, well, into the air, let alone in, into the space. Incidentally, just as an add-in here, friends at home, NASA still offered a million pound reward for anyone that could get a rocket into orbit um, up until like fairly quite recently, which is um, quite, quite interesting in itself. But you had these young, let's call them young dudes that are, they're out there, they're expanding their consciousness with all kind of mind altering um, substances. And they're, they're, they're trying to, and I think what happened is they realized that their conception of physics was so limited by uh, tradition and traditional method that there was no way they were going to get one of their rockets into space. And so what they did was started to explore the occult, 
wondering if there's some way they could summon up a, a magic to get these craft into space. And of course, at the same time, or may, maybe not at the same time, but in the same vein, of course, the Germans were doing the same thing. They had all their um, National Socialist Party scientists who were desperate in the Second World War to, to, to um, obviously master rocket technology. And as we know, in Operation Paperclip, they were then given um, immunity from prosecution to, to come over to form what, what would have been the American space program. And of course, what we now know as NASA. And you hear that these scientists were into the occult. I'm guessing just because they're incredibly open-minded and they're exploring all kinds of, of possibilities. Um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that or, or knowledge of um, knowledge of this, because even to this day, you see some, um, there's kind of hints of Masonic symbolism around, you know, what NASA are, NASA are doing. I, I, um, yeah, no, I won't go there, but, um, and then when you see things like the, the parallel that they landed on the moon, that was 30, 30, 33 degrees and, and um, yeah, I, I just wondered if you had anything to add. Well, Richard Hoagland's book, uh, Dark Mission, I think it's the subtitles, The Secret History of NASA is, is a good place to start because he talks about how NASA, which largely founded and run by Nazis, right, was founded on occultic symbolism. And they apparently had, and they're not the, by, only, by no means the only institution or culture, if you will, that had a similar obsession. But they, they being NASA, had an obsession with the constellation of Orion, which is not surprising. Uh, Orion's even mentioned in the Bible, right? So the, the Freemasonic aspect as well, like so many of the uh, astronauts and so many of these guys that had the right stuff, right? Uh, the early test pilots and what have you, many of them were Freemasons. So uh, that's not surprising too. So on the one hand, they have the non-disclosure, the standard kind of fair non-disclosure secrecy oaths and on the other hand, they have the, the Freemasonic uh, secrecy binding oaths, uh, pain of death kind of thing, right? So it doesn't come to me as any surprise that in an institution such as NASA, and I'm sure it's pretty much across the board with these other federal agencies, uh, there's a strong Freemasonic uh, network at work. A good, a good old boy system, if you will. Uh, and as far as the magical aspect to it, uh, Bill, the aforementioned Bill Hamilton, uh, I've got the book somewhere. He wrote it uh, and he entitled it Alien Magic precisely for that reason, because uh, there is this lack of a better term, magical aspect to this. Whereas some civilizations throughout the cosmos had the technological means to get from here to there, I mean, traverse tremendous distances, but in a nonlinear mode, like I said, other less sophisticated civilizations had to find other means to accomplish the same thing. And we know that they do some of these adepts warlocks, medicine men, medicine women, what have you, shamans have the ability to open portals, portals that go from here to there. I, I talked earlier about how these reptilians were coming out of a closet. Well, there wasn't a tunnel there, a tunnel entrance coming out of the closet. There were, it was an energetic 
uh, uh, portal opening. It, very quickly, I'll tell another story. Um, I knew personally the late, great Bob Brown, who was the founder of the International UFO Congress, right? And I was telling him about these high desert Southern California investigations I was doing where I was in this house and the reptilians, and there was more than one portal entry in that house. There was one in the living room and different places, but most of the activity was in the children's bedroom. That's why we, we would spend the night in there often. And I told him about how they were coming out of the closet, right? Well, he happened to know a, a former defense intelligence agency remote viewer, a woman, I won't say her name, so what he told me to do, if you remember the old Polaroid cameras, he told me, get a Polaroid camera and just go around taking pictures around the house. Also take a picture of that closet, right? And that's what I did. And I sent these pictures to Bob Brown. He turns around and gives it to this remote viewer woman without giving her any details about anything going on there, right? She quickly zeroes in on a photograph of the closet. It was a sliding closet door. So I slid the, the sliding door over and I took a picture. And if you look at the image, it's just like a clothes hamper, a whole bunch of hangers. That was it. Like nothing to write home about. But because she's this remote viewer, she immediately saw that it, it, near the floor was an energetic portal opening. And she told Bob and said, this is a portal opening. There are creatures coming in and out of this opening into and out of this household, right? And again, Bob didn't tell her anything of what I had been telling her, right? So that's an example of these portals. And I, I, I should add that a lot of these so-called cryptids, <clears throat> these, are, uh, these are life forms that are not recognized by mainstream zoology, but they exist. We call them, you know, there's different types of them, Sasquatch. In Australia, they call them Yowies, but there's also Dogman. These are large, upright canine, bipedal canine looking creatures. But some of these beings, besides being flesh and blood, some of them have an interdimensional aspect to them. And according to the Native American lore, some of these so-called cryptids of various stripes, they know where these portals are that are naturally occurring. So they go in and out of our world to their world. And that's how they get around. Like a lot of eyewitnesses have seen the Sasquatch in America just abruptly disappear in a, in a, bl in a blinding flash of light. And I, I know other people who've seen Sasquatch come out of a portal okay, and go back into a portal and disappear. So the ability to utilize these portals, and I believe there's a worldwide uh, portal network, a grid, if you will, and I believe that this portal network, if we scale it up to Stargates, goes throughout the cosmos. It's just a means for beings who've developed the know-how to get around. And I do, do believe that the, uh, the traditional shamans, the yogis, the uh, medicine men, medicine women, what have you, some of them, and I, th I think that this know-how, this knowledge has been passed down throughout the ages. And I think that some of these uh, adepts, these warlocks, these really dark black magicians also utilize this capability not only for travel for themselves, but they open up these portals to let these malevol malevolent things in. I think that's a big part of their whole shtick is to, right now, I believe that the veil between worlds, plural, is very thin. And uh, I think as time goes on, as they start cranking up certain types of frequency modulations, if you will, uh, that these membranes between worlds become even more porous and i think more and more of these malevolent type beings will start coming in to our reality and i think that already we're seeing uh, a mass psychosis is taking place throughout the world where people are just 
either so dumbed down or so mind controlled or so hypnotized. And in some, in many cases, I believe uh, there's a big time case of lack of a better term, demonic infestation. Uh, some kind of dark pervasive evil has just taken over a lot of people who in, in the recent past even were not like that, but something has happened. Something may have been administered, let's say, but also just as likely uh, because of all these portals and, and the veils between worlds are getting so thin now, the fundamental constants are changing, uh, that more and more people are being taken up, uh, essentially possessed uh, by these entities. And I think we're starting to see that play out, that there's a madness that has uh, overtaken so many people on this planet. Yes, massively. I mean, you are by definition, if you're, if you're living in your, let's call it your bestial self, so your, your lower being, so that you're, to use an old fashioned expression, you're out on the town chasing tail, you're overindulging in food, you're ingesting substances, you're angry at work because that guy's got that position and you have, all of all of these uh, e ego actions, you are um, in in spiritual terms or biblical, you 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 or, or scriptural terms, you are on the dark side. It's kind of really that simple. You can take it one stage further, and I meet a lot of really well-meaning people, and and they they're good people. But when you're pushing a religious agenda, what you're essentially doing is creating division. You're saying, if you're not on this boat, if you're not on board this one with all of us, then you ain't shit, right? As opposed to recognising that we're all, I think someone messaged me earlier, Ian Brown said we're all star stardust in one of his, one of his songs. And I think until we can all realize that we are, we, we're, more, we, we're a carbon structure, we, we come from, we, we are part of the universe. So we are the universe experiencing itself. Therefore, the only thing we should be expressing to each other when you're me and I'm you is, is love, love, kindness, empathy, understanding um what what else would you have for someone else if they're you but while you create when when you chuck religion into the equation and and when you chuck nation states and and war what what you're essentially doing is corrupting that beautiful connection that we could all have with the universe because um when you're saying that, hey, yeah, I'm in this religion and it's like the best and you've got to find this one, you know, you've got to find it. What you're essentially saying is that I'm different to you and I'm not. We are, we are, we are the same. How that fits in, this is why when I think about interdimensional or interplanetary travel, if people had the ability to do that, they'd be such an advanced um, population or such an advanced species they would realize what I've just said. That would be, they did, wouldn't need that explaining. This brings me on to my next thing. Is So when you see Fox News trying to glam up the, the alien scenario in, into like imminent alien invasion on the cards, and then you get these... I'm going to, what what you could argue could be fantasists talking about a space program and 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 do you remember Star Wars back in the eighties? You know, it's a bit. I mean, that was slightly different. That was to shoot down nuclear missiles, but now they're talking about the same. You know, space troopers and all this. Just what I would say is just ridiculous nonsense because if people can travel here. They are way more clever than your stupid bloody satellite tin can junk that you can only just get into the uh, 
high Earth orbit, which isn't very high off the planet at all, and it's nowhere near space. Um, so, so what I'm getting to, James, is when I see them building up this this alien threat in the media, as opposed to looking at it from a scientific point of view, it's like bloody hell. If there are a, it, that is so clever, like how do they do it? You know, then what I'm what I'm wondering is, do you think we're heading um, for a, I don't even want to say the term, uh, but let's just call it a false event where when we've seen a vo- false events in uh, recent history and we know we know what they've led on to, do you think we're going to see a similar one with an alleged alien invasion at a time where, as you said, the population has become so uh, naive and, and docile that there are, and of course we've all been indoctrinated with the space, uh, the space lie since we were children through space, 1999, star Wars, star Trek, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. I just think, and, and what we've seen this, in recent times with what people will totally believe without doing any research whatsoever and then live their whole life in fear off the back of it. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if that's, if there's something on the horizon and I'm going to go one step further and make a prediction here. The, you know, big Ben is the, the big clock tower in London. Uh, the famous one. In fact, actually, I think it ref- the Ben Big Ben refers to the, the the actual bell. So somebody put it in the comments. Help me out here. But anyway, they they've had scaffolding up on that structure. They had it up for years, and I'm just I'm just <laughs> just wondering if the 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 controllers have been filling it full of uh, explosives. And that we're going to see an alien invasion that blows up our houses of parliament or blows up Big Ben. Um, and that I think I think I saw that with the Mars Attacks movie, right? Where the White House gets you know attacked. Well, what do they call that? Houses of Parliament get wiped out. Don't they call that predictive programming where they put in the yeah, movies yeah. what's going to happen so people already have an, a, a, a memory of an, of an event? that hasn't actually taken place, but the memory comes from the fiction from Hollywood. Um, I think we've, we've seen that, again, surrounding... Well, you, you talked about the malleability of, of the public mind. Just look how the official narrative, narrative is plural. You know, it takes this meandering course where, you know, they, they come out with information that completely contradicts their previous official line, and it's taken on board hook, line, and sinker, and then when you hear the, the playback from the people around you, they're re- repeating word for word without question or without any critical analysis the latest BS they just heard. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it contradicts what they've been told before. So, you know, the point being that they can be made to believe anything. If, if the, the media got on a witch hunt and said, you know, attack the next person without a without a face covering, let's say, mm. right? There's a lot of people that would do it because, you know, they're in the grip of this madness that I was talking about. So to, getting back to your point, uh, my perspective of it is I already feel that this planet and the, and the human race is under this thraldom, uh, no pun intended, right? Uh, this uh, cosmic vassalage, if you will, they're already under control by an alien, probably more than one alien race, the reptilians being one of the the usual suspects in our example. So if something like a fake alien invasion happens, it's because these non-human players behind the scenes want it to happen. And the technology exists to to fool people, basically. Uh, these people will believe anything, uh, no matter how absurd and no matter how illogical. So whether it's a fake alien invasion or some other 
big lie. It just history is just a never seemingly a never ending succession of big lies. And, 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 and the real shame of it all is anyone that had the self-worth and would put the time and effort into it could find out almost anything they want and would be able to refute uh, in no time flat so many of these big mainstream lies. But, you know, the path of least resistance is just to take on board everything that a perceived master authority figure tells them, right? So, you know, the point being that they will believe anything they're told. The easiest thing to do is to scare people. The easiest thing to do is to make people hate and direct rage at a person, Donald Trump, for example, or an institution or a certain demographic. Nothing simpler than directing rage, you know, this, this angst and this anxiety and fear, which they've already engendered in all these people, whether it's to direct rage in a certain direction or to engender just mindless animalistic fear uh, in the captive population, nothing simpler either way. It's the easiest thing to do. So I, I don't, I'm not, I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that they will pull a stunt like that. Uh, but you know, my qualification is that it would be aliens, ironically behind it all. <laughs> that that would be, and and I say this after you know in depth study, and also if if you want to go back into the history, the etymology of the ancient languages, Aramaic, Hebrew, Latin, uh, about the source of. Archons, the source of serpents. Remember, the, at one time, the, the predominant religion on earth was serpent worship, right? Serpent worship of all things, right? So the, um, the existence of these reptilians is embedded, is encoded in numerous languages. And if you want to get a guest on here, that'll give you an earful about that. That would be Pierre Sabach, who I've had on my show. He's well known in our field. He's he spent decades studying the Aramaic, studying the, the Egyptian, studying the Hebrew and the Latin and the Greek, and and he just found in this huge corpus of of information from way back when that they're all saying in their own way that there are these beings who come here and craft that have this abiding interest in the human race and very often interfere with the human race and do things and present themselves as gods, literal gods. So that's a person that I encourage your listeners to plug mm -hmm. into his work. His name is Pierre Sabak, S-A-B-A-K. Yeah, I'm just going to interject here and say we've also got to be careful because the, the civilizations that have gone before us if uh, they appear to be far more advanced than us with, with respect to understanding like the whole shebang. Um, you just look at the pyramids, you know, when you, when you consider that they're, uh, they, they were, the, the theories now coming out is that they were built to produce energy in the same way that Tesla was able to produce energy. And you look at the materials that they were fashioned from the water running that runs the, the deep water that runs underneath the copper that's been used in, 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 in this, I believe it's copper, um, the, the fact that they would have been gold capped originally, it, it, it shows you that these ancient civilizations, and I'm not talking about the Egyptians that we know, we, we don't know if this goes back years and years again, that they knew way more than us. But one thing they also were very uh, familiar with was the concept of the Kundalini, getting your body in perfect alignment with the universe and new experience, this natural high that's just makes life so worth living. I talk about this a lot because it's just a great place to, uh, a great place to live. And when, when you understand why you have to be in this spiritual place in order to make a connection with the universe and put, be a force for good in the world, 
and when you're in that place you want you don't need anything you can't buy you couldn't buy me like a ferrari and it's going to make me any happier than if i sit in the garden with 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 the sun on my face it's it, it becomes you know all this greed this hate this bitterness this bigotry this one it 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 goes when you make that connection so of course the elites they don't want you to make that connection that's why they keep you indoctrinated in your angry uh, in your childlike left brain because they don't want you to uh access the right hemisphere of your brain and this goes back to the the garden of eden story where adam and eve went east of eden they they moved to the right hemisphere of their brain and and that that axis that opens you up to enlightenment then but what we do have to be aware of when we talk about reptiles and snakes and this is that the the symbol for the kundalini is the snake wrapped around the staff very often caduceus the caduceus and that's all that's also the symbol of the american medical association in yeah. america yeah and american sans front uh, sorry uh, medicine sans frontiers that it's traditionally always been put there right in front of your face and yet you will never find um a general practitioner well you might find one or two but you're never going to find a doctor that knows anything about that i went to my gp lately and uh, i i talked about you know alkaline diet which for people listening know it doesn't mean that you become alkaline because that's just as bad as being acidic it, it means that you recognize your body as a living entity has a ph balance and it's really important to respect that with, with what you put into your body my doctor was like what's that <laughs> this is a person that's supposed to fix you when you're ill well right? <laughs> I did a commentary lately on my podcast and called it Rockefeller Reptile Medicine because uh, when the Rockefellers uh, back in the day, uh, through the, the power of the, uh, phil the philosophical grants, right, which they would pour money ostensibly for these philosophical uh, altruistic purposes, they poured into education, poured into the medical field, and they entirely re-engineered medicine as we know it. It went from more tradition based to this pharmaceutical base and the root for pharmaceutical is pharmacopoeia which is sorcery is what it really means yeah so and they uh, adopted these... louis pasteur's germ theory even yes, though louis yes. pasteur ended his life saying i was wrong they adopted yes. this notion that you you get sick from other people as opposed yeah. to you get sick from 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 within but going back to yeah. the the snake and the reptile thing it's just important that we acknowledge in many cultures gone by, ancient cultures, that they, they knew this Kundalini experience. It was it's what they probably lived for. And hence some of the serpent symbology and reptile symbology is it actually represents that as opposed to like a, a sort of an entity, so to speak, or a, a living um, entity. I mentioned that because I've seen David I speak about such things and go, look, this this is reptilian. And it's like, no, no, that that represents the chakras. You know, this seven headed snake or whatever represents uh, you, you. It's represent your body's bio, you know, biology and how that biology interacts with. Yeah, the wheels, the, the chakras, uh, you know, up and down the, uh, the spinal column. Yeah. But of course, there's chakras in the palms of your hands, your kneecaps, your elbows. There's smaller chakras all over. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think that the the, the serpent iconography, the uh, serpent symbolism, is always depicts something of evil necessarily. I think that it it goes both ways uh, because, like for example, in in China, even in modern times. Dragons are perceived as, you know, wise, benevolent uh, beings, right? They, they are not regarded with, with fear and trepidation as they were in, in old Europe, right? Uh, dragons, so-called. So, I mean, it runs the gamut. And just like everything else in our, our reality, uh, it's based on dualities. Uh, the problem is that, you know, the more parasitic, archontic beings, if you will, uh, they seem 
to have more sway and more influence in our world. But what you pointed out, you know, the power of our heart center, the electromagnetic dynamo, which resides within all of us, which can be measured, you know, quite some distance um, outside of our physical body. It's, uh, it connects us to all that is. So when one thinks about how much time and effort they put into uh, inculcating this, this shame-based belief in ourselves uh, and, and making us believe in limitations of ourselves uh, and how worthless we are and instill all this fear and anxiety and trepidation in us. I mean, they must really fear us <laughs> to get to go to all that trouble uh, to make us you know, crawl into a shell as it were, you know, as, as it is, but you look around it, it's had quite an effect on a lot of other people. So if, if, you know, if we make an effort to stay grounded, stay embodied, but, but just remember that, you know, we are multidimensional infinity and this is not our first go round. A lot of us, I, I'm a firm believer in reincarnation. So this is not our first barbecue. A lot of us, it may, this may be humanity's at least, this version of humanity, 4.0, 9.0, whatever it is, this may seem like, you know, the darkest hour, right? But I would also say it has a potential to be our finest hour. I do believe that a lot of us chose to be here. Now, we could have incarnated any other time in history and not have to be here, but we made the choice to be here because each one of us can make a difference. And I, I know that a lot of your listeners and viewers are, are carrying the torch too. I know that they're making a difference in society. Uh, never underestimate the power of one, one determined man, one determined woman uh, to, to make a difference in this world. And, and that's the key, not fall for their gains, not get pulled into their false flags and not get uh, suckered into you know, some kind of act that can be manipulated and spun out uh, give them the justification for more oppression and what have you. Uh, resistance can manifest in many forms, but it, it's, it comes from within, it comes from the heart, it comes from the mind. And then one does not have to be physically violent in order to resist. I mean, if you walk into a store and you, you treat it disrespectfully because you're not adorned with something on your head or your face, then you just turn around, you take your business elsewhere. Yeah. Right? Um, that's, that's how I deal with uh, such issues it's um i'm not going to let them upset my equilibrium that's that's a failing on my part <laughs> massively james listen we were going to talk for an hour weren't we and we've gone we've gone it just shows how much i enjoy talking about this stuff and exploring all the possibilities but i love talking to you mate you're such a a, a wonderful man Thank you. And I feel the same way about you. You're doing a tremendous job and you did a great job getting that, that, uh, that pair of guy on your show the other day. That was brilliant. Yeah. You so know, we're, keep we're, up the we're, great in a, work. we're in a spiritual battle and we, we need to start understanding this for what it is. And majority of it is fear based. If you're going out doing certain things in sight, because you're afraid of, of maybe you will, end up with something that that ain't that they've got you that is control it is control we're all perfect beings in the universe we're we're all the same we're all made of the same stuff love empathy kindness is the only way there is no place in it for fear because one thing we do know is we're made from carbon we cannot go anywhere any molecule in my little fit it's been here since the dawn of time it will be here forever and ever and this is just an it's not an illusion but it's this this whole thing about creating people's identities it's just so that they live in fear worry about what they look like what car do they drive what job have they got what house do they think you know what does this person think of me what is it it's just it's all an illusion it's absolutely an illusion live for the now you get one time in this space so perhaps i don't know but um to, to spend any of that precious, what it was, it maybe we're here for 80 years or something, to spend any of it in fear uh, and, and 
disenlightenment, <laughs> unenlightenment. It, life's too short. Life is too short. And people that are pushing fear-based narratives, they got signs on their shops. They've got people, their staff are like wearing weird things, right? Don't go there. Do not go. This is this is your children. They are putting in a cage for the rest of their life on behalf of these entities, be they psychopaths or be there some some something higher there that we we're not too sure about yet. But whatever it is, it's your reality will be what you create in your mind. And that's why I will never live in fear. I will never kowtow to somebody else's immoral agenda um because you get one life it's just worth living so james massive thank you again friends at home if you could like and subscribe that would be really kind if you could support the patreon because let's be honest how much did we pay to bbc all these years until people woke up and stopped paying paying that that criminal charge um we paid them a lot of money didn't we we're not asking for that on the podcast. We're just saying pay us pound ninety nine a month. It's half the price of a cup of coffee. It's not a lot because where, where you're not going to hear this stuff on the BBC. You know, you're not going to hear this on the mainstream media and it's important to support the truth. And it's a war out there and it's really important to, you know, pick your sides carefully and, and support them. Anyway, I've said enough. Much love to everyone. We'll see you next time.